and men. Isn't the Lord good? Isn't He powerful and strong? Isn't He bigger than you ever expect? Well, you know, in um, Jesus' day, He preached a message called the Sermon on the Mount. At least that's what we've uh, come to call it. And He started out with something called the Beatitudes. And some people have called them the be happy attitudes and they've called them all different kinds of things. But in the midst of that be attitude, he said this word in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know what the promise was after that? For they will be filled. They will be filled. A promise from God today. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. How many of you guys have been praying for revival some parts of your life? Maybe some of you have. Maybe some of you have no idea what it means. It's when God's people really allow God to get a hold of them and it begins changing the world around them. You know what the key to revival is, guys? You and I hunger and thirsting after righteousness. Because the promise from God is that we will be filled. Do you hear that? And do you believe the word of God today? Uh, And amen will do. Amen. Amen. His word just speaks so true. I'm going to ask you a question today. Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Are you thirsty? Some of you right now is in the first service. They all made a beeline to get a cup of tea afterwards. Are you thirsty? And I'm not talking about a physical thirst. Some of you may be. You may be just saying, man, I'm a little dehydrated. I need some water. I need this or I need that. We're not talking about that. Is your soul thirsty? Because that's what God is pointing to today. And and when we look at the Beatitudes and we look at the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus taught there was shocking to the people. And, uh, you know, maybe we should call this, uh, are you shocked? Well, I don't think so because it was shocking in a way because here were these group of people that have been hearing about the Messiah all of these years and they've been studying the law and they've been studying the Bible and they've been going to church and they've been doing all of these things, all of these things that were supposed to, uh, you know, get them to God, that people told them they would get to God. And, and here when Jesus began to teach and He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they will be filled. And it's like you see God just overwhelming them. And it's not so much a shock as it is a sheer relief that when they get that thirst and that quenched from God, and God just begins to fill them up so completely, it's like, wow, this is what I have been missing all of my life. And some of you said, well, Craig, I I had that experience when when I came to know Jesus and wow, God just touched me and I recognized this is what I've been missing all of my life. And I want to tell you that was true in my life. (laughs) But my question for a lot of you today is, is how thirsty are you now? Because the truth is, as God word, God's Word just begins to pour in us, it should make a thirst that cannot be quenched, and yet the quenching continues to be filled up because Jesus fills in us uh, that river of life that just overflows. And yet some of you, if you're honest with yourself today, would say, well, wait a second, Craig, I, I, I understand some of that, but I'm a little messed up because the truth is, I'm thirsty, I need the touch of God, I need His presence in my life. And yet, I I recognize that He promised that He would fill us completely. And and I'm going to challenge you today because I believe that a lot of us have come to the place where we have either quenched our thirst or we've blocked it with our messes. And so now we've got to allow God to remove the dam and break it down so that His presence and His Spirit are all that you care about as the Word of God opens up your heart and your life. You know, the truth is, it's been true throughout history. People hungering and thirsting. The songwriters have written about it. We we sing a song now, O breath of God, come breathe within. There must be more than this. O breath of God, come breathe within. Fanny Crosby, one of the older hymn writers, 
She wrote about it in He Hideth My Soul. Do you remember that hymn? Some of you are probably humming it in your heart. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. She went on. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock the shadow that shadows a dry, thirsty land. Do you hear it? That longing of that dry and thirsty soul. Do you feel it? Are you thirsty today? You know, the psalmist wrote about it. In Psalm 63, here's what he said. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. All throughout history we've seen people crying out, I need that thirst. I need it quenched. I need it to be filled. And Jesus comes and He says, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And there's the promise today, folks. The promise of God into your life where He says, if you really, if you really hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you really hunger and thirst for Me, if you really want Me in your life, you're going to have it filled. So today the question remains, are you thirsty? Is that the picture of your soul? Are you thirsty? Is your soul longing? Is it longing for the living God? I have to ask the question, have you ever let the Lord fill you? Have you ever come to know Him as Lord and Savior? Because that's where the initial drink comes. For many of you, the answer is yes, Craig. I've done that. But the truth is, you come and you realize that you quit drinking at some point. You quit drinking of His presence. You quit drinking of His Spirit. Perhaps the Word of God just became something dull to you. Something that you put aside very easily. Perhaps it was like maybe one of those Gideon Testaments that you put up on the shelf and took down three years later as the guy did earlier. You got busy. Or you began to pursue after other things and you, you forgot that you couldn't satisfy that thirst in those other things. It could only be satisfied in Jesus. Or you went to church. You did the things you thought you were supposed to do. You, you had your quiet time. And yet, you still thirst. I usually rise up pretty early on Sunday mornings and... Uh, it's not out of intention. It's out of, I think God just wakes me up. And so this morning I, I rose up very early and I knew deep in my soul I just needed Him. You, you ever been there? Lord, I just need You. And uh, so I, I, I got to my quiet time and I've been reading this devotion uh, that's online. I read through the devotion online and, and I closed it up. And have you ever gotten to that point where you've read through something and you realize you didn't let any bit of it go in you know the word of God just said, sat there and you read it and it, you, with your eyes you read it maybe you, you were conscious a little bit but it just didn't sit in and folks that's where I was now I don't know about you but in, in the morning time I, I sometimes don't function very well um, or at all we have some stairs right outside our bedroom and I imagine there's going to be some morning I just go blah 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 because I've missed it and uh, so I'd read that devotion and, and I closed it and I looked up and boy, I had one of those awesome moments where God, um, you know, took out a proverbial frying pan and smacked me right in the face. And you guys go, well, what? Yeah. And woke me up and said, you didn't get what I had for you this morning. You didn't get it. I had an opportunity for you and it was to meet with me. And you missed out on it. and You, you just didn't get it. And, and do you want it? And, and at that point, that frying pan hit me and said, Lord, there's not anything that I need more right now than to be with you. 
And I opened it up and God just <laughs> began to fill in my dry soul. And he began to, to pour in to me that manna that he promises every morning. And he began to shower in that, that well of blessing that just began to spring up in my life. And I began to realize, wow, I just so needed it. Yet so often we get to the place where we're just not in contact with the living God. And we're running through life as if we can take what God gave us a long time ago and it'll be A-OK. -okay. And folks, it is not A-OK. -okay. And sometimes everybody around you knows it but yourself. But definitely God knows it. And so we get to that point where we ask ourselves the question, are you thirsty? There's an a, a incredible story in John chapter 4, one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture where Jesus is meeting with the woman at the well. And the woman at the well is one of these ladies that um, uh, she, wow, she's a mess. She's had so many husbands and yet here's Jesus meeting her right where she is. Just right where He is with you today. In John chapter 4 and verse 7 it says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to Him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Doesn't that sound good? Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and livestock? And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. And you get the promises of Jesus where he says, Drink. Drink. Fill it up and drink. Fill it up and drink. You know, folks, so many things in the world seem to be upside down. And we look at them and we say, wow, that looks great. But something just does not seem right. And perhaps it's a little peculiar. Or perhaps uh, you have the niggle in the bottom of your stomach that gives off these huge warning bells. And whatever it is that triggers it, you come back to the simple reality that something is wrong. But you often can't quite figure out what it is wrong, nor can you figure out what you should do to, to get out of it. And for, for many of you, what is wrong uh, is that the simple aspect that God provides for you, this well of river, of water, of His presence and His Spirit flowing in your life, and somehow you dam it up or you quench it because you don't feed it. And folks, today, what God wants to do is touch you. Touch you so that you can quit blaming everyone else. Do you hear me today? No one else has caused you to not meet with God. It's just you. He wants to touch you. So that that love that you had when you first came in contact with Jesus springs up again. He wants to touch you so that the Word of God comes alive. He wants to touch you <laughs> so that you begin to say, God, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, He wants to touch you. <laughs> So that you quit lying, cheating, deceiving yourself, and you repent. And let him change you. We're all there. We're all at that place. And we sing, Lord, I need you. We're singing, Lord, fill me. Fill me completely. Lord, touch me. 
How do we do it? How do we start? Where does it come from? Jesus later on in the scripture in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, just a little bit further on in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek ye first Him. You know, most of us have heard that scripture over and over in our life and we've heard it so much that that it becomes numb to us, that we don't really listen anymore. Seek ye first, and we think, oh, okay, well, I, I'm having my quiet time, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that. And what God wants is so much more than that. What God wants is for us to get to the place where God is in the midst of all our priorities. Every part of our life, we're saying, God, it is yours. You are mine. I want you to direct my path. The truth is, when Jesus laid out the Sermon on the Mount, when He said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. I believe He was laying out foundations which we can stand on for the rest of our life. That He was laying out a cornerstone that was intended for us to rest on. And a cornerstone for us to live on where Jesus becomes our all and our all. And God becomes our central thought and our central being. That knowing God is the most important part of our life. And what God desires for us is to allow Him to really become those things that we stand on. That we can know Him. Now, when I say that, I recognize that many people have an idea that being with God is all about telling Him our cares. Maybe that's you. And giving Him a list of requests that often sound like a Christmas list is being delivered to Santa. And folks, I want to challenge your understanding today on, on that. I want to challenge your understanding on what seeking God and knowing God is, is all about. You see, seeking and knowing God is more about listening than it is talking. You know, we also have a tendency to presume on God. To not really meet with Him. I, th I think it's Satan's ploy. We go through the motions. We may even have a devotion. We come to church, but we don't let the Word of God saturate our heart. We become as stone. We don't take the manna from God each day. We don't allow Him to fill us up with His water. We don't feed our soul. Oh, wow, we presume on God. Any of you guys recognize that picture? That's a picture of St. Andrews on the 18th green of St. Andrews. Now, um, if, you've have, if you've never been there, then plan your trip right now. You need to go. <laughs> it's the greatest place in the world. This is uh, the winner of last year's British Open. It's a guy named Zach Johnson. And some of you have no clue who this is. Bear with me. Some of you have no idea about golf and couldn't care less. Bear, bear with me. This is one of my uh, things. <laughs> You see, I, it became one of my things when my grandfather first took me to the golf course when I was four years old. And you say, Craig, how in the world could you play golf at four years old? Of course I couldn't. But I hit the ball and I crawled on the back of my, my, my grandfather's you know, bag in his little pulley. And he pulled me around the golf course until I got to the ball again and I'd hit it again. And so those were some of my fondest and earliest memories of golf. And, and so from that time to the age of about 30, I was an avid golfer where I loved to play and just enjoyed playing. Now since then, and I know some of you are looking at me and saying, Craig, you're not over 30. Thank you very much. But since then, I've not been an avid golfer. I've been an occasional golfer, something that I play every once in a while and, and wish that I was good at. Um, but imagine if I had met Zach Johnson yesterday and we began to talk and have a great time and uh, I, everything I read about him he's a great guy and so I'm sure we'd just have a great time <clears throat> we'd have a great time because I would be going wow you've reached the pinnacle of your success uh, it was a great win last year I enjoyed watching it and you carried yourself so well and it was great to be a and wow it was just super but imagine if a, a, an 11 or 12 year old kid came up and he recognized Zach Johnson and wanted his autograph and Zach signed uh, that autograph and we began talking to the 11, 12 year old kid 
and we realize what a great kid this boy is. You know, he's a super kid. He's incredible. And that kid said, you know, my dad promised me my first men's set of golf clubs this year. And, uh, and uh, I, I just wanted your opinion. What, what do you think I ought to get? And so I jumped right in. I said, well, you ought to get these clubs because they're the best clubs in the world and so on and so forth. Now, guys, I want you to think about what I've told you. Um, now, now, since the age of 30, I've just been an occasional golfer. Uh, my, my newest set of golf clubs is about 10 years old, and I love those sets of golf clubs. But, but in the last 10 years, I want you to think about technology in our life. Has it changed? Leaps and bounds, hasn't it? And golf clubs and golf equipment have changed with it. But I immediately jumped right in and said, you need these clubs. Folks, there are at least 10 years where I know nothing about golf clubs and probably more like 25 years. And there, right beside me, is Jack Johnson, the guy who just won the British Open. And he has a company called Titleist that, that gives him equipment to try out. He has all the golf balls. He, the truth be known, I would love to have any of his cast-offs. I would love, yeah, great, thank you so much. Anything. And yet here, as this 11 or 12-year-old kid needed advice, I jumped right in and said, this is what you need. I would be doing that kid a horrible disservice, wouldn't I? Because right beside me is the guy who knows about it. And folks, in very similar ways we do that with God. God, this I know about life, so you need to do this and you need to do that. Folks, repent. Get to a place where you say, God, I want to hear from you. God, I want to know you. God, I want to tell you what I presume on life. God, I need you to teach me about life and I need you to fill me up. God, will you do such a mighty work in me? God, would you please? I want to seek after your righteousness, not tell you what my righteousness is. Folks, repent. And as we get to that place, we begin to recognize that God has laid these foundations for us and they're foundations where we seek Him first. Why? Because He is a good God and He is a big God and nothing slips as missed and He is able to do exactly what He wants to do. And sometimes those things that are the most difficult in our life are God putting it there because you need it. And He's a loving God. He is precious. He cares about the hairs on your head. And it's about having faith and trusting that He is both big and both loving. And as we seek Him first, we're saying, God, I recognize You're both big and both loving, and I trust You. And I have faith that no matter where You leave, I will follow. And that becomes a foundation for our life. What's your foundation today? What's your foundation? You see, because if our foundation becomes something of a mess, we begin to look like this. The Leaning Tower of Pisa. Now, I've never been to Leaning Tower of Pisa. I look forward to the day that I get to go. I hope that I get to go. But uh, I, I understand that, that it leans like this and at one time had to be made stationary. And that if you're, if you're at the top of it, there's, there's so much of a lean that one side of the, the, the building will be about um, six feet less than the other side. Incredible, isn't it? It leans because at one point when they began putting down the foundation, they didn't realize that the soil was incredibly soft there. And very quickly as they built that building, it began to lean. But folks, I want to tell you that if that foundation is not laid on the right things with God, there are things that happen in the midst of it. Because you're able to, to walk in the Leaning Tower of Pisa and you're able to climb it. Did you know that? I didn't know it. I looked it up. I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to climb the Leaning Tower of Pisa? But the truth is, I have trouble with a little vertigo. And, and if you climb the Leaning Tower of Pisa, my understanding is you're climbing it like this the whole way up. Can you imagine what you'd feel like when you got to the top? I think I'd be hanging on to that, that low side and feeling like I was going to fall off completely. 
But it, it gets even worse than that because the foundation was messed up to begin with. Look at what the steps look like. They are wavy. They are crooked. They are a mess. Folks, if the foundation of your life is not built on seeking God first, your steps are wavy. They are crooked. They are a mess. And folks, if you've lost contact, with seeking Him first. Turn to Him. Repent. Seek Him first. And we get back to the question, are you thirsty today? Do you want Him? Then seek Him first. In Jeremiah 29 verse 11, the Scripture says, "Would God's talking, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Folks, today, we cry out for what the old timers called revival. Where God's people get in touch with God and the Spirit of God moves mightily. And what we are crying out for, Jesus promises. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. I don't know about you folks, but today I want the rest of my life to be filled with a consistent hungering and thirsting. I hope you do too.